The Severn Valley in the west of England is renowned for its beauty. Although it's close to the cradle of the Industrial Revolution, it escaped the worst ravages. So you still have great stretches of rolling farmland and woods and unspoilt river valleys. The market towns and villages like Dursley and Wotton Under Edge remain unscarred by industrial development. They have whole streets that go back hundreds of years. But the unspot beauty is not the reason we came here. We came to put a major paranormal theory to the test. Is there a link between geology, the rocks under our feet, and psychic events? Particularly where those rocks are under great stress, as they are where they've been cracked and folded and faulted. This is one of the most actively researched ideas among paranormal investigators, and it's given rise to a whole range of controversial theories. One of the things which has always intrigued researchers into the paranormal is why some areas appear to be more haunted than others, why some buildings have many legends attached to them. Could it be that the actual answer to this lies in the rock strata beneath our feet? In recent years, parapsychologists have paid more and more attention to fault lines. There is a growing belief amongst certain schools of parapsychology that these fault lines in some way are generating an energy which is allowing the haunting to happen. There are various schools of thought on the matter. The more orthodox or conservative parapsychologist or skeptic might say that minor earth tremors, minor seismic activity could cause many of the poltergeist type effects which we see in this part of the country. Another school has argued that rayon gas, an inert gas, is released immediately prior to earth tremors and that this can take on a luminous glowing form which can appear as an apparition to some people. But perhaps the most intriguing possibility is that a form of energy, possibly a sub-microwave level radiation, is released by the fault and that this in some way interacts with the human neural system, with the human brain. Does it make us more psychic? Does it make us more likely to hallucinate? We don't know at this stage. It was this latter theory in particular that interested us. The possibility of a link between stresses in the rocks, the Earth's magnetic fields, and the electrochemical activity in the brain. And to put these theories to the test, we chose a small stretch of the Severn Valley, only 10 miles or so square. It's an area that's crisscrossed with stress and fault lines, like cracks and wrinkles in a well-worn face. It's also an area that has a long association with unexplained and unusual events that stretches back over many hundreds of years. This area has got an incredibly diverse range of paranormal activity. So you're saying really that it's a hot spot of paranormal activity. And what I have noticed in my research is that if we look at the ancient megalithic sites, um, the stone circles, the tumuli, the barrows, the standing stones, that they are all to be found in areas where there are geological faults. Most of them, I think 80% of them, are in Cornwall, um, up through the west part of Somerset, through Wales, the Lake District and in Scotland. And these are the parts of Britain that are intensely geologically faulted. But all that was far too general for our purpose. We needed a much more specific linkage. We were looking for places where two things came together. One, pronounced paranormal activity over many years. Not just the odd event, but repeated unexplained occurrences witnessed by two or three or more people. And second, proximity to a well-established fault line. We started with the old bell in at Dursley, an old coaching inn that was hemmed in by no less than three well-marked fault lines. We had um, two builders at one stage staying and they were burly men's men builders, <laughs> typical builders, and they were coming down to breakfast one morning. It was about 7.30 and they came running down the stairs, white as a sheet, and they were really scared. They just um, met an old man in the corridor, they'd said good morning to him, and he disappeared in front of them, and they were really frightened. I had um, a long distance driver stopped overnight. He parked his cab in the car park, um, went to bed as normal, we'd arranged for an early breakfast. I came down, got it all ready, waited and waited, no sign of him. Um, I assumed that he decided to move on without paying. Uh, checked the car park, only to find him asleep in his cab. I tapped on his window, inquiring what was going on and basically he said, well, I can't come back in. He'd actually seen a figure of a gentleman 
um, an old gentleman. He said he was very well dressed. He just walked in and walked straight out through the door without opening it. Um, with that, he, he panicked, got dressed, and spent his night in the cab. I went upstairs, and as I was starting to do the tables, I was in the middle of the room doing one of them, when I thought I heard somebody call. And I looked in the mirror, which was down at the bottom of the room, and nobody was there. So I continued to set the table. But as I was setting the table again, I had this awful feeling somebody staring at you and you just had to turn around. So when I turned around, there was a woman in the doorway and she just put her finger up and says, come here, like that. But she didn't mention a word, just as if she was saying, come on. So I looked and I said, just a minute, please. And I put the dishes down and started doing, and I turned around again, see had she gone? And she was like this and I thought, oh, there's been a guest I haven't seen and she wants something, so I went. And as I got out, there's two steps there. I thought, did she jump those steps or am I imagining it? And I stood and then she went around the corner and she was halfway. And instead of walking, she was just gliding up those stairs. So I came down and I told Mr Lloyd and he started to laugh at me. And I thought he was going to give me the usual Irish jokes about it, but he didn't. And he said, you haven't seen her now. I said, seen who? He says she's out again, is she? There were many other stories of apparitions, but also accounts of repeated poltergeist activity, sudden unexplained bursts of energy that cause strange noises or move things around, or just simply surprising events. When fr Thursday or Friday I came in here, I can't remember when it was, in the afternoon, hot summer day, and um, came into Bama to have a quickly chat what was going on the weekend. And uh, we all of a sudden we spotted above us in the corridor downstairs that the central heating pipes were all frozen over, completely crusted over with white, white ice. Same as inside your re refrigerator cooler box, like that sort of white stuff. So anyway, so me and Bamble said that was quite strange, so we followed it down into the um, cellar where the system is. And it, uh, we got down there and <laughs> he couldn't believe it. That it, He said, well, it's even switched off, so how can something be going wrong when it's it's even switched off. And, you know, bearing in mind it's a blooming hot day. We had no explanation for it, so we came back upstairs and stood there carrying on talking the conversation. <laughs> just sort of couldn't really work out what it was and sort of tried to forget about it. And uh, within a couple of minutes, you know, it all started dripping on our shoulders and thawing out and just cleared slowly. You could watch it clearing all the way back down. Old ladies floating up and down stairs severely frightened lorry drivers. It would seem like a positive strike. The bell-in met both our conditions. But it didn't end there. The fault line at the bell happens to run along the main street. If the theory has any validity, should we not expect to find at least some activity in one or more of the neighboring houses? As soon as we began our inquiries, we did. One of the faults, one of the three faults, runs directly under the street or just behind the street, within 30 metres of the whole length of the street, according to my calculations. The other two faults actually run at 90 degrees and frame the bell on either side. Down the road from the bell are the sites of two other public houses, which, again, have their own hauntings associated with them. Even further down the street, we have another house where I was once informed a monk has been seen. Now, I'm always sceptical of monks because, of course, they can be any kind of shadow. But if we move further up to the other end of the street, we have a shop in which there is yet another apparitional encounter. We spoke to one of the people who lives above the shop in the house at the top of the road. She didn't wish to be identified, but she and her partner had experienced such an overwhelming number of strange and otherworldly events over the past few years that they were no longer frightened by them. They'd become a familiar part of their lives. It's just weird little things like you can't, the room would be absolutely immaculate. You, come, you go out, you come back, everything would be all over the place. You know, all over the place, as if someone's just come in, trashed it, and gone back out. You know, it's, it's weird. And sometimes when we're watching telly, you hear funny noises and you see like shadows. Um, when I think it was yesterday morning, my boyfriend woke up and he seen sort of something stood there at the side of him. He just went cold and he couldn't go to sleep for a while. He just put his head into the covers, like, and he told me the next morning. And I said, Oh, it's probably because you don't talk to it. Steve, my boyfriend, says to me, oh, you shouldn't talk to it, you know, something might happen. But when you talk to it, you just feel like a cold, sort of, the room goes a bit cold.
but then it, it's never actually sort of physically hurt me. It's touched me on the arm and down the side of me, but it's never actually sort of gone to push me or physically hurt me in any way. In our quest for paranormal events, possibly linked to geological faults, we moved east from Dursley to the village of Ewley and we called upon Alpen Manor. It lies close to the centre of the village and the geological maps show that it lay very close indeed to a clearly established fault line. What about paranormal activity? Well, it seemed there was indeed a long history of unexplained events in the house. One of them had occurred only a few weeks earlier. Now, the little girl who has suddenly appeared in the house, I mean, I'm sure she's been here for a long time, just that we haven't been aware of her, but suddenly now, for the last six months, she's very much in, in evidence. I had to put some towels out up here, and I was coming through the, the corridor over there, and I, um, I came along and I saw this figure standing on the stairs, it was a, a couple of weeks ago, and um, she was standing here, and, but I couldn't see the whole of her because the door frame was blocking the rest of her view, but I could see some legs and some socks and black shoes, and I think she had a, a, a short dress on. And I was utterly petrified, I couldn't move, I was kind of rooted to the spot. And, and it, it couldn't have been any lights or anything because it was about 11.30 and there, was, there, was no, there were no lights on, there was no moon and there was no sun. So she was just standing there kind of unmoving, completely unmoving. And I, I couldn't quite believe that I'd seen a ghost. And then suddenly I just kind of thought, I've got to move. And I, I dropped the towels and ran back. And I was completely kind of shocked that I, I'd seen something kind of bizarre and not of this world. His whole, whole face was sort of drawn and... And um, he said, oh, I've seen the little girl, I've seen the little girl. And I then went through, I mean, I wasn't particularly happy about seeing the little girl either, but I went through and all I could see was just a light in the staircase. And I asked her to go to bed. And that was the, so far the end of it, I don't know. By now, word had got around of what we were doing. We were asked to call in on the Ram Inn, or the ancient Ram Inn, to give it its full name, in the village of Wooten Under Edge. But did it lie close to a fault? We checked, and indeed it did. A fault runs down the valley under the house. Again at short notice, we called in to talk to some of its customers. Myself and a friend come down one night, and uh, we both sat in uh, the dining room over there, I think it was then, and John, the owner, said to me and to my friend, he said, there's something very strange about that corner over there. And he pointed and from then I was launched off the sofa, literally picked up, physically threw off the sofa, onto the floor, I mean, coughing, spluttering, um, took all the wind out of me. And uh, thereafter, I mean, I heard John saying, quit, look at me, look at me. And we both looked up, and he was literally pinned up against, there was an old oak dresser, I think it was. He's pinned up, up against his legs off the floor. Just look at me, look at me. And it's, it's, it's something, that I don't think I'll forget in a long time. I mean, even sort of 10 years ago, I mean, those sort of things will stay in your mind. I mean, something very frightening and very real, something very intense, yes. Yeah. I'd recently lost a, a relative, and I mentioned this, this name, Tom. I was just talking about, John was talking about ghosts, and then all of a sudden, as soon as I said that name, Tom, this heavy presence came down. And that's all it was at the start, it was like a presence, like you could feel it. And that wasn't really a lot. I didn't really go with it then. And then all of a sudden, it was like, I went to move, but I couldn't move. It was like, I couldn't move, like being sh shut by electric. John's hair was stood up on end. My hair was stood up on end. The radio in this room was going up and down, up and down for about 10 minutes non-stop. We just couldn't stop it. It was, it was really getting out of control. I was sat in one end of the attic, which was our front room, and the attic's an L shape, and the other end of the attic was our bedroom. Me and Stuart were sat in the front room, and it was about nine o'clock one evening, and we could hear all this crashing and banging around. And we got a big dog, he's a Rottweiler, and I thought, well, perhaps he was trying to get in behind some furniture, because it sounded like furniture moving. Anyway, the noise stopped and uh, we just sat and looked at one another and then the noise started again, so we decided to investigate. We got to the bedroom doorway and looked in the bedroom and we couldn't see the dog. Uh, we did notice, however, that a cupboard next to the double bed was missing. 
It was that usual bedside cupboard with a drawer in the top, a few books in it, and uh, a door in the bottom. And it had gone. <laughs> well, we decided to look for the dog then, so we looked down the stairs to our right and uh, noticed there was no dog, but the actual cupboard was stuck sideways in the doorway at the bottom of the stairs. Well, it was a bit of a shock, really. <laughs> um, we had to move the cupboard in order to get out of the attic stairway. I carried on down to the bottom floor to see where the dog had got to, and I found the dog cuddled up in a ball against the door of my father's front room, um, shivering. Um, it was about two o'clock in the morning. Turned all the lights off and uh, got into bed. And a few minutes later, I was actually starting to fall asleep and then uh, suddenly all the lamps started flickering just very briefly like that all around the room which uh, unnerved me a bit it was a bit scary but it wasn't too bad you know i thought it was a bit of a joke to be honest someone was playing a joke so i actually unplugged all the lights uh, apart from the one by the bed for obvious reasons and then uh, they kept on doing it after that so i figured you know that's something a bit weird something a bit weird is happening there um, so i actually still stayed in the room because uh, flickering lights aren't that scary. But then uh, suddenly I felt this thing jump on the bed. It was a kind of a weight and I felt kind of paw prints walking up my body and I turned the lamp on by the bed because I hadn't unplugged that one. And I couldn't see anything except these four indentations, uh, two in my chest, two in the top of my legs. And uh, I just got up and left the room and slept downstairs the rest of the night. We actually visited seven or eight locations, all of which were very close to fault lines and in all of which there seemed to be a clear record of paranormal activity. Most of them were older houses, dating back a hundred years or more, but there is a predominance of that kind of house in the area. But one of them was modern, a filling station on the M5, where during the building of the motorway there had been many reports of sightings that seemed to be linked in some way to the Civil War, a mounted cavalier for example. Another case which I'd looked at very briefly recently is a petrol station, a very modern high-tech service station on the M5 motorway. And there we found that there were throughout the late 70s and early 80s rumours of a phantom cavalier. More recently, a chap who was driving home one night down a road behind the service station saw a figure appear in front of him and then pass through his car and vanish. And if you were to draw the connecting line, the geological line, down from the service station towards Dursley, you would find that the actual point on which the encounter occurred is, with on, is actually on the fault. So, at least seven sites, all very close to established faults, all with repeated reports of paranormal activity. Of course, that does not mean there is a causal link between the two. It doesn't amount to a scientific proof. But undoubtedly, it's a remarkable coincidence that in this small area, we should find this close correlation between faults on the one hand long-continued psychic activity on the other. And of course, this is not the only part of the country where this relationship has been observed. So, what's going on? What are the theories about the nature of the linkage between the stresses in the rocks and the psychic events? As you might expect, there is no shortage of controversy. Some parapsychologists believe that all that's happening is that underground earth tremors or underground seismic activity generates movement or the release of gases such as rayon which are seen as apparitions or which move objects and that people are m mistaking underground movement or even underground water under their house or subsidence. Th those conditions are causing people to believe that their home is haunted. Other parapsychologists would go much further and would say that the underground seismic activity in these faults can generate sub-microwave level radiation which can affect the brain and can affect our actual consciousness. Some parapsychologists go as far as suggesting that this may affect our neural transmitters and actually possibly open up new realms of insight, make us in some sense more psychically susceptible, more able to see things we normally can't. The theory that as I understand it at the moment is that the human body is exquisitely sensitive to changes in the Earth's magnetic field. The pineal gland that is within the centre of our brain is sensitive to the most minute change in the Earth's magnetic field and in response it makes chemicals that take us into an altered state of consciousness whereby we shift into a mode of thinking that is more dreamlike, connecting with archetypal mythic type reality. 
When we're in an area like this, which has got multiple fault lines, the energy of the earth is such that the fault line tremors, or just the presence of a fault line, is going to affect the earth's magnetic field. Some scientists have argued that um, there could be a, a sort of physical explanation for these phenomena. That geomagnetic activity, either caused by fault lines or power lines, somehow interfaces with the brain and causes anomalous experiences. And they presented various types of evidence to support that. For example, if you map where the fault lines are in this country and then map where the poltergeist and sort of haunting sightings are, you get you know, something that looks like a correlation. The two seem to be matched. These are very controversial theories. It's early days yet with them. Uh, there are lots of different sort of measures of geomagnetic activity. And certainly if you search around hard enough in the data, perhaps you'll find one that matches up with the ghost sightings. So it's, it's not a hard and fast theory. You know, maybe it's true, maybe it's not. It's certainly one that needs to be taken into account. One of the most interesting developments is that this issue is now being researched scientifically at the Faculty of Parapsychology at Edinburgh. And it's coming up with all kinds of fascinating insights. I mean, science already knows that we have a lot more than five senses. Five are all we tend to admit to in everyday life. But on top of that, we have uh, heat receptors, movement receptors. We have uh, tactile receptors in our skin, lots of different types, uh, pressure sensors, and so on. So we're already picking up a lot more information than we're normally aware of. Now, some paranormal phenomena could be due to this. It's just things that we're not normally aware of that for some reason has been brought into our awareness. But as well as that, so there's the whole range of these electromagnetic and other phenomena that we're starting to see do have an effect on our brains. Part of the problem has been that uh, most of the scientific models of our brains tend to be computer simulations. They're digital models, you know, brain cells can be on or off. Whereas our brain is actually an analog, it can have a whole sort of range of uh, frequencies in between this on-off state. So we're starting to see that we are a lot more responsive in ways that we hadn't realised before. All over these islands, indeed all over the world, there are specific sites that seem to have a long association with spiritual or paranormal activity. And many of them are linked to geological stress points or formations of rocks and stones. The nature of the linkage has always puzzled and intrigued scientists, and it's long been a cause of controversial debate. There is no doubt that controversy will rattle on for many years to come. But could it be that we are on the verge of a whole new series of insights into the mysterious relationship between us, our human senses, and the rock strata under our feet. <laughs>